Hello, everyone. This is Ricky Baez, Director of People and Culture for Four Corner Resources, and you're listening to Higher Calling Podcast. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for listening to Season 2 of the Higher Calling Podcast. I'm Pete Newsom, and this is your source for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting, but with a really big twist. I did Season 1. It was good, but it wasn't good enough. So for Season 2, and hopefully for all seasons going forward, I'm going to be joined by Ricky Baez, and we're going to tag team and do this together. So Ricky, you can introduce yourself better than I can, so go ahead and, and, and take over. Well, thank you, Pete. I really appreciate it. People are probably wondering who is that voice at the beginning. Um, not that I'm patting myself on the back that it sounds great, but it's definitely an unfamiliar voice. My name is Ricky Baez, and I am the new director of people and culture for Four Corner Resource. That's a really fancy way of saying HR. Because uh, just, you know what, Pete, lately, people think HR is boring, right? H so. HR generally is boring. Perhaps that's why, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, fine, right? It is. But you know what? You got me here to make it unboring. So let's let's say HR doesn't have to be boring, but too often it is. How's that? That You know what? It's agreed. Agreed okay, 100%. Cool. So, um, yeah. So, um, um, again, I'm Ricky Baez. I've been in HR for about 20 years. And um, it's I'm one of those few people, Pete, that I love what I do. I really do love what I do. You know, if you ask a kid in, in elementary school what they want to do when they grow up, they'll tell you a teacher, a fighter pilot, an attorney, a doctor. No kid ever says, I want to be an HR pro when I grow up. If if you hear a kid Except say that, for you, you, are you the one? No, I'm not the one. You know, were you, I, were I, you dressing up as an HR guy for Halloween? And if so, <laughs> I want to know what you were wearing. What does well, that here's costume the thing. look like? Me dressing up as Hall as HR for Halloween is scary for a lot of people. So that's a timely thing to do. <laughs> no, right. but I'm not that one kid. It's uh, later on. I I'm lucky enough, Pete, to have a career find me, not the other way around, a career find me that I really enjoy. So I'm happy to be on. I'm happy to be on board. And I'm looking forward to see where this takes us. I really we're, we're happy that you found us, too, at Four Corner Resources. And I'm even more personally uh, happy that you're you're willing to do this podcast uh, with me, which uh, while hey, you know, there's so many great things to say, so many uh, wonderful things to talk about, important things to talk about, it's always better to have a partner uh, to do this with. And I'm, I'm genuinely excited to, to be here because the last episode I recorded was speaking of Halloween back in October, which, oh. is, which is kind of embarrassing. That was not the intention, but it became the thing that I procrastinated about uh, uh, too frequently, and so we're we're here to to make a clean break and a big improvement going forward. So, yeah, huge welcome all around. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. So, now that I've been around for a few weeks, actually a month, um, it's um, I'm 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 getting to see what we do here. Now, I knew what we did here at Four Corner Resources, but we obviously we are a staffing organization, and at the end of the day, what our job here is, and obviously Pete knows this because he started the company, but everybody else who's, who's listening is to find the best talent for the right client. But it's gotta be the best fitting talent, not the most qualified one. It's gotta be the one that fits the best with what the client is looking for. So Pete, we're in 2021. I know you know that, everybody else knows that. And actually we're over the hump of, of, um, of 2021 and, a lot of people are out there still a little bit confused about what you need to do. You as an employee or a candidate, somebody looking for work, need to do to get their foot in the door. What the ideas or the, uh, the, uh, the processes that worked two, three years ago are no longer relevant right now because of how the pandemic has changed the workspace. So what do you, I think what we should talk about today, Pete, we should just talk about how to get that foot in the door, how to make sure that you format your documents or your resume for 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 that matter, in a way that stands out in a sea of other resumes. Now, granted, 
before the pandemic, that was still a hard job for a recruiter. A recruiter has 500 resumes and they got to pick one to make sure that the client is going to just love. Now it's just that much more worse, right? That's right. So it does start with the resume. And, and I think it goes without without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that we, there's so many aspects to, you, you could answer the question where to start. Mm -hmm. um, there's not just one place, there's many, but we're gonna try to keep this somewhat concise uh, and on topic. So let's, let's just talk about resumes today, if that's okay, and get into other things later like social media, and how to, uh, how to network and, and how to work with third parties like Four Corner Resources. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. But it, with resumes in particular, that is the cover to the book is, is how I often think of it. And we all know that you shouldn't judge a book by the cover, but we also know that it's very common to do exactly that. Um, you know, if I watch my wife, you know, browsing you know, magazines at the checkout counter in, in Publix, She's looking at the covers. And if you think of a, of a resume that way, that will be your a really good start because it, it really is your first chance to make a, a, a first impression and perhaps your only chance at, um, you know, at, at making any impression at all. So you really need to make it count. And uh, I think you know, it, it's one of those areas where everyone has made a resume at some point in the past, but those who aren't used to uh, changing jobs very often probably aren't entirely comfortable doing so. And um, it, it, you know, there's a lot of advice from a lot of different people, um, friends, family, neighbors who, who, you know, I see professional resume writers uh, out in the world. Um, but there's just a few core and really critically important things that if you do, you'll really set yourself up for success. So I'd like to focus on those areas today. Awesome. Awesome. So resumes, <laughs> uh, it, it's, I don't know how long the, they've been around, but they have been the marketing campaign for people looking for a job. It is the, I, it is the workforce oldest commercial, pretty much, right? Because you have to put all your skills, all your abilities, everything you can do on this document, that, this piece of paper. The how a resume works obviously has changed throughout the years, right? Now social media is big. Um, the 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 more softwares are out there, the more intuitive they become, and the more you have to be um, aware of how intuitive they are, so you can get past the applicant tracking software. But if if we can for a second, okay, let's take a step back real quick. Let me take you down this road, Pete. I so, know you really want to talk about artificial intelligence. I can tell. I, I see it. I, I can see it. That's where you're going with this, isn't it? I'm going, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. But before we get to artificial intelligence, let's talk about real intelligence. And that okay. is what the candidate has. So if if a candidate is out there right now looking for a job, and, and look, look at what happened in 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 April. Four million people decided to leave the workforce because they didn't want to come back into the office. So, so that's 4 million people that are out there competing for these jobs with other organizations. I guess if we take a step back real quick before we start taking a deep dive into resumes, what are some of the things that the candidate can do right now, even before a resume is there, to start building that relationship with a potential recruiter? So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it, I'm going to keep us to resumes if I can't, because that is its own episode, right? I don't yep. want to answer that one, one right now, other than to say, you need to cast a really wide net. If you okay. are listening to this and you're, you're beginning your job search, whether it, it's something you haven't done in many years or, or something you're doing as a result of the, of the recent changes in the world, um, just know that the advice I will give universally is to cast a, as wide a net as you possibly can. Let everyone know you're looking. Uh, you need to network. That it, it always starts with that. And we'll talk later at, uh, about how to work with third parties, you know, third other you know, recruiting firms, how to how to network. You know, with some specifics behind it. Mm -hmm. But you, you really want to make everyone aware that you're that you're on the market and ask for help. It's a very simple thing to do, but something that many people are hesitant to do. Um, but don't be afraid to ask for help. In fact, go the opposite direction. Ask everyone you can, so you can be exposed to as many opportunities as 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 you know you possibly can be. But then, you know, what comes next is typically that resume. Yep. You know, send me their resume, and you described it very well by saying it's 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 the world's oldest you know, advertisement of sorts and when it comes to jobs and it is it's an it's an advertisement for you it's a chance for you to put your best foot forward and 
have the viewer of that resume make a quick decision on whether they want to proceed. And I think of it as reading you know, headlines on a newspaper. We made a reference to a magazine cover. It's all in the same sphere as someone's going to take a quick glance and decide whether it warrants a deeper dive. So the, the first thing I would always say to anyone creating a resume from scratch or updating one after, after many years is you want to create your headline with your best accolades, your best accomplishments, the thing that you want to be seen for first. And you know, that is always um, you know, what you want to put the, at the very top of your resume. Mm. And in doing so, this is equally important, you want to customize it for the receiver of the resume, mm. whether it's you know, it is a, a someone generically that is, let's say it's they're in sales. Well, you certainly want um, that person to not question whether you're interested in a sales job or if you have sales experience. You want that to be front and center. Uh, if you're sending it uh, in for a specific job opening, well, it makes sense to make sure that your resume is tailored for that specific job opening. And it's a mistake that no one needs to make, but we see repeated way too often in our world as, as, as recruiters, you know, where we see many, many resumes, you know, day in, day out. Um, but it's, it's absolutely something to avoid. So I would, I would give that as a first recommendation always put your best foot forward. Let, let, let's talk about that piece for a second, because as a former recruiter, I used to manage a, a an entire recruiting team. One of the things that we saw is that people do what I call the shotgun approach. Okay. Right? They have like five different jobs and they send the same resume for those five different jobs. And they get a little bit of, I get us upset because they don't get any bites. And so you hit on something that's really crucial and that's molding your resume to the job that you're applying for. Why do you think people have a hard time doing that? Because I've seen that. I've seen people do that. What, what, what is the driving factor that, 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 that people tend to shy away from um, and actually tailor into that specific job? So it's a good question. I mean, other than, you know, I don't want to say it's, I don't think, anyone does it because they're lazy, right? Which, which I think it's because they just don't realize it's, it's an important and necessary thing to do. Um, you, you mentioned earlier, I think you said, you know, 500 resumes, you know, that it could be given to any one opening and that's not an exaggeration. And that's really important as well. You know, we constantly hear uh, of people who are frustrated that uh, they've applied to lots of places and they haven't been selected for any of them. Well, that's because they were one of many, many applicants. And so if you just step back and look at it objectively, try to answer the question is of what is going to allow your resume to be picked out of the pile? Assume there's a pile, right? Assume that it's going to be competitive. Um, all the good jobs are. So why would someone pick out your resume versus another and then proceed accordingly with answering that question as you go? Because, well, Pete, I'll, I'll answer that. I expect people or recruiters to pick my resume because I printed my resume on neon colors and I put perfume all over it. That's right. Well, while while perhaps charming and 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 somewhat interesting, you know, for you to do, it's recruiters don't really have time for that, yeah. right? I mean, it's great. You know, when we we have, probably should should clarify when we say you know, make that commercial for yourself, right? It's in the professional sense always. I mean, it's great that you you like walking dogs. You know, it, it's great that you know you 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 know like you know, you're a circus clown on the weekend. Um, those are you know it's wonderful that everyone has hobbies, but you you back to this getting one shot. Yeah. You don't want to distract the reader from anything but what's most relevant and important for that particular role. So. Um, you know, it, it, there's a chance, there's always an opportunity, you know, and it's a risky one to put your, your own flair to it. I don't know why that word comes to mind. Um, but, but that's, that's kind of how it sounds to me. And we do see, you know, you know, crazy colors, but, but in almost every case, you know, consider that the resume is going to be viewed, um, online, right? Mm -hmm. So those things, you know, aren't really going to stand out. And if they are, it's probably not going to be in a good way, um, and so, you know, proceed with caution if you choose to do anything like that. There, there are calculated risks, and um, but, but that's probably not one I would recommend. Got now, uh, it's one hundred percent understood. So, you know what? What about the age-old question, Pete? Cover letter or no cover letter? So that that always comes up, and you know, the and I, and I, we've written a number of blogs on on fourcornerresources.com about resumes, and I 
I'm not looking at them right now, but I can also always almost guarantee that I've probably included it in the blogs I've written that we recommend that. Um, so if it's a choice between more or less, um, doing something that others would not do, I would say do it. I'd also say write a handwritten note without exception every single time. It makes a difference, right? It, it's, a, it's a subtle thing. It's not a silly or goofy thing. Uh, it's professional in nature, but it does make a difference. And similarly with cover letters. But here's the, here's the hard reality. In almost every case, they're not really going to be read. But, you know, and so if you just you consider the book analogy, um, you're, you, the, you have to look at the cover first to decide whether you want to open it and read you know, the introduction um, or read the preface or even read the summary and the cover. So it, if you don't get past the, the headline, so to speak, the rest of the content's not really going to matter. And it, so that, that's the reality of a cover letter. I, you know, if, if I'm being completely transparent, I would say it's probably your time and energy is probably better spent as a follow up. In, with something like a handwritten note, with hmm. something like a letter, uh, if you don't receive an initial uh, callback or, or um, any feedback after an application that an initial resume sent, I would say then you know, write the letter. I mean, but I, I probably need to go back and change what I've written in some of our articles uh, to, to support that. Well, you know, it, it's been my experience that um, it's now I love cover letters. I do because the reason I love them, Pete, is because the resume shows what you can do, right? That shows your skill set. The cover letter gets personality to that skill set, right? So in my experience, and my advice would be, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is if you're going to go the route of, of a cover letter, make sure that you give it personality, not too much personality, but just make your skill set come to life. Because you're right, a lot of recruiters don't read a cover letter. They go straight to the resume. Even then, they spend how much time? Uh, um, on a resume, six seconds, six to nine That's seconds, right. taking a look and like, okay, and then you have to capture their attention for those uh, six to nine seconds. But what if you write a compelling cover letter that gives the, the recruiter just enough information to say, I want to know what this guy's talking about. I want to know what she's all about. So what about a compelling out of the box skirting on the edge cover letter? Is that something you would be right. opposed to or not recommend to? So, so truth be told, I'm answering from a staffing, mm -hmm. you know, third party recruiters perspective where, you know, we are screening through, you know, potentially dozens of resumes an hour. Um, and your six, six second rule certainly applies. So, you know, from your, you know, you're the HR professional, you may be looking for those things that um, in a perfect world, right, we'd have time to address um, and you know, I, I'm torn about that because you know that's contradictory to me, right? How do you how do you reconcile knowing that you're only going to get six seconds? I'm saying things like headlines and you know book covers, mm -hmm. and how do you reconcile the the cover letter in that because it doesn't really fit into that that you know, that scenario? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I get it, right? Because that is the the cover of the book. Um, and that's tough these days, right? Because uh, it, it's, it's, I don't know if you can upload a cover letter to the point where the ATS system would pick it up in the same manner that a resume would, but this, this kind of brings me into the, uh, into the, uh, into my next question, which would be, you know, as far as the different types of resumes that you're supposed to have. In my experience, I've seen a lot of people who try what what I like to say uh, a, a pretty resume with pictures and all these things. And it's really hard for that to filter through an applicant tracking system. So the advice I've given people, Pete, is have two resumes, an ugly one and a pretty one. The ugly resume has all the information that you want to come out of the applicant tracking system that way it comes for whatever keyword that the, the recruiter puts in. And then when you go into the interview, you don't bring that resume. Now you bring the beautiful resume with, with all the different designs. Don't put perfume on it. Don't print it on weird paper, just enough so it could stand out from any kind of a pile after all the interviews are done. Have you heard of something like that? Yeah, that, I, I haven't actually thought of it that way, but I think you just answered the question, you know, intentionally or not. That's the, that's the right combination where, you know, get, you know, I wouldn't necessarily think of it as an ugly resume either, but fine, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, but 
you know, there's, there's many reasons to, to do that. And you mentioned applicant tracking systems. So what happens when an application is sent uh, to either a corporate entity or a recruiting f- firm like ours, uh, it's uploaded into an applicant tracking system or what we refer to as an ATS. Mm-hmm. And if there's too, mi- too much goofy formatting, it's not going to load correctly. It- it's going to be very difficult for that um, to, go, uh, to go in the system and be found and searchable. Um, so that's a great point. So don't get cute with your formatting. Um, don't use tables in Word. They never come across well. Uh, you stick, stick with just really plain text in, in your, we'll call it ugly resume, that is sent digitally. How's that? Can we, can we call it a digital resume versus I like a hard that. copy? I like Let's that. go with that. We'll, we'll, we'll get our own, our own terms from that. We got it. Because <laughs> it's not something we've, we've, I've thought of. And the reason is because we almost exclusively work with digital resumes okay. you know, through, through what we do. However, we tell every candidate you know, and make sure that you know, before they go to an in-person interview, they do bring a hard copy. And that's the perfect opportunity. And I wouldn't say pictures, Right. And, you know, perfume is optional, I guess, but um, I'm joking with that, by the way. <laughs> What's that? I'm joking with that, by the way. I, I have seen that before, though, that I you have know, scented scented paper. Right. I mean, yeah, you know, maybe subtly, but the uh, but that would be the time to if you, if you feel that, you know, compelled to have it be a little more fancy then then do it then. But definitely keep it basic with the digital. Got it. So we've talked about so far how to market it. We talked about how to how to how to put those things together as far as to get that recruiter's attention. Let's talk about what the recruiter is looking for. So the recruiter or the hiring authority, actually, they both partner together to figure out who is the perfect candidate for this role. Hiring authority gives the recruiter all the things to look for. But one of the things recruiters look for is career progression. And if they don't see it on a resume, that regardless of what kind of skill set you have, if they don't see pro- career progression on there, how would that affect your chances as a candidate to get selected for that role if you don't clearly show how you've progressed in your career? So you can't make up something that doesn't exist, or you shouldn't, right? There's certain you know college football coaches that at times will make up things on their resume that didn't exist, but that's, that's a different story altogether. Um, apologies to UCF fans, but uh, in, <laughs> in terms of you know, what you should put on a resume, it, you know, if you have career progression to show, absolutely. Is that going to give you an advantage? No question. But if it's not there, it's not there. And that's something that I you know, would, certainly a point we should make today is don't make up things that aren't true. And mm. we can touch on that in a second. Um, but yeah, you, you, you of course, you, you want to show that advancement. Um, but the, the main thing that the recruiter would look for, I would say even more importantly, is relevance to the role that's open and the one they're recruiting for. I mean, that is what, you know, is so important back to our earlier point of customizing the resume. While you want it to always be ac- an accurate representation of who you are and what you've done, mm-hmm. You also want to highlight those things that are most important in that moment. So, um, you know, n- not anyone is only one thing. I'm not sure if that even makes too much sense, but everyone is more than one thing. Got Be it. the thing that's most relevant for that role that you are, right? That, that's probably the weirdest thing ever to come out of my mouth. But um, the, you know, the, you, you want to highlight, again, what's going to give you the best chance and what's going to give you the best chance is relevance for that specific opening. I agree a thousand percent, Pete. Something else that I think is is going to give you that edge is the difference between a resume that shows what your skill set are and a resume that shows how you use your skill set to move the needle from A to B. So it's really important for a candidate to really put down on a resume, yes, your skill set, your knowledge, skills, and abilities, KSAs, but to really give it that umph is how you use examples of how you use those skills to move that needle from A to B. Would you agree? I, I would. I would for sure. And and so yeah, the you know, the, the, that point I wanted to get back to is just to quickly say, you do um, never ever you know put things that you can't defend. Don't put if you it is on your resume. It is fair game. And so all right, Ricky, for from an HR perspective, right. Um, what do you look for? So I'm, I'm, you know, I have lots of opinions as a recruiter uh, who's, who's been doing this for a little while now. Um, but what, what do you look for that, or, you know, even more, 
also interesting is what are the things that you consider to be knockouts on a resume? You know, the, the hard mm. don'ts, if you will. So um, that's a dangerous question, Pete. Here's why. Uh, because for me, I have a weird way, a, a weird rationale as to what I look for. A lot of people think that the best thing you can do is to find the, per the person with the most skills, with the most education. And I found out that is not the case at all right? Because if you put all those skills and all that education down there, all that tells me is, you, is that you have that skill set. Okay, you got it. What I want to know is how are you going to use that skill set for my organization? I want evidence of that. That's what I want to see. But what I look for is that you have the minimum qualifications of the job. Are you capable of performing that skill set within my organization? So I'm going to ask questions about that not more importantly but almost as important are you a good fit are you a good fit for the culture of the organization are you a good fit with the team and here's why i say that quick example you've got a team of 25 24 people you need one more the 24 people they work well with each other they get along great they know how to interact they know how to have healthy conflict and then you bring one person who's got an insane amount of PhDs, all these skill sets, but they don't know how to communicate with people. They don't know how to uh, mesh with each other. They, they don't build chemistry. Would you bring that person in just because they got that skill set? I would not, because to me, the importance of the skill set is not as important as disrupting the team. And that's what I think that would do. It would disrupt the team if you bring somebody else who doesn't mesh. So that's how I do it. Minimum okay, quality. All right, but I, got, I have to challenge you on that a little okay. bit. All right. How are you going to determine that from a resume in an interview, meeting them in person, speaking live for sure. Right. But how does that come across, um, you know, on a resume? How's it going to be portrayed? I look at the call. I look at the cover letter. <laughs> Seriously, I do. I do. I look the at the cover, cover letter. I just told people not to write that cover letter. <laughs> I'm just, look, I'm just being honest. To me, the cover letter gives everything personality, right? Because anybody can put on a resume that I reduced risk by 15%. Anybody can do that. But I want to see you speak to that. I want to see how passionate you are about this position, how passionate you are about the culture, how passionate you are about putting teams together. And you're right. I'm not going to get that from a resume until I get to the interview. But to me, how I get that from the resume is how connected the cover letter personality is to the resume, the skill set. So that's how I look at it. So the, 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 the next question is going to be, Ricky, what do you do when you don't have a cover letter? <laughs> because a lot of people don't put a, a cover letter. Look, Pete, social media is a great tool. <laughs> okay, that, we're not doing that today. No, that's we're not. A, I know. No, that's, <laughs> his own, that's his own deal. Okay, okay, but I have to say, you know, thinking about this, uh, the vast majority of resumes you know, we look at are uh, they're coming from one of three ways. We'll say one is they're they're online somewhere in a database. You know, we could that could be LinkedIn, it could be Indeed, it could be Career Builder. They're online, and so we're not looking for a cover letter. We're looking for a specific you know, set of skills, background, experience, whatever it might be. The second way is jo job applicants coming in. You know, we post for, you know, we have all our positions open on our own website. Sometimes we post them on, on third-party websites. And when those resumes are coming in, uh, they're typically not going to come in with, with a cover letter. The, the third is, is referrals. We get a lot of referrals, mm. uh, which is the lifeblood of a business like ours. So mm -hmm. We, again, are generally getting a resume just sent over. But all of that said, when we send any candidate to a client, almost without exception, I'm sure there's exceptions, so I won't say there's not, we send what we call a you know, candidate summary or write-up that effectively is a cover letter. Mm. We send our explanation of why we're submitting that particular candidate for that particular role, um, which pretty much accomplishes what you're looking for. It's the why this candidate, you know, answer. So now I'm thinking, okay, if, if I'm, if it, in a scenario where it wasn't an online, it resume in an online database, it wasn't just a generic job application. If I was sending a resume directly to you, right? Blindly, you know, mm -hmm. to, to Ricky um, specifically, then absolutely I would write a cover letter, which would be an explanation of why I think I'm the right candidate for your job. So, yeah, I think my 
answer is more indicative of, of the, the habits that we've created in the digital world, right? I, you know, I'm not seeing cover letters because there's really no place for them in those scenarios I described. So um, maybe, that, maybe that's a difference, but all things being equal, yeah, if I was going to email you a resume blindly, I'd put a cover letter with it. So I'll call it a cover email. I don't know that I'd go write the letter. I wouldn't. I'd write a cover email. All right. So we've got the resume recruiter pulled it right. Um, now we, we, we've interviewed, we went through that process. Now, after the interview, what should a candidate do after the interview? Cause I know we haven't really talked about interviews too much in this show right now. We, Man, we, you said we were doing 30 minutes today I and you want to do social media <laughs> post post interview. <laughs> What? Okay. All right. Pete, I, this is, I love this, man. This For the is record, what before I this, you said, Pete, you can't go, you can't start talking about too many things. We got to do 30 minutes, but all right. No, you know what? It, it's look for everybody listening. Pete's hundred percent, right? I said, we got to stick to 30 minutes. Let's not be all over the place. That's exactly what we're doing right now. But I think, you know I think what? we just created like five more reasons to, to do other shows though, but that's good. <laughs> we do. We do. You know what? But, but it's good conversation, Pete. It really is good com because the, it's people out there listening right now. Now, they, it's, they want to figure out what is the newest thing they need to be doing in order to get that foot in the door. So yes, resumes, let's tailor it. Let's make sure it's in chronological order. One more thing that we do have to cover, because I got to make sure, and I can't believe that we do have to say this. People think so fast that they write as fast as they think, and they make little mistakes that can really derail the whole resume process. Checking spelling and grammar is crucial, folks. It is crucial because that is your first impression of yourself, of marketing yourself to an organization. And something as little as a spelling error or a grammar error can really derail you. I mean, it's, would you not agree? Yeah, I'll go even further and say, you, you absolutely need to have someone proofread it for you. Yeah. Don't trust your own eyes. You, you, you won't pick out the mistakes because they were your mistakes. You know, it's, you've, you've made it uh, inadvertently and you're probably not going to catch it. Your brain won't. So definitely have another set of eyes, you know, look at it, but that that's, it, we, I can name many examples of hiring managers who, who I personally know who would automatically rule out a candidate because of a grammatical error. Mm. Um, and, and their logic is this, and I can't dispute it. If that's all I know about them, right? Back to this idea of their best foot being forward, and that's their best foot. What can I expect in their work product after that? Yeah, right. I mean, and, and that's logic, you really can't dispute. So that's one of those areas, even if you don't know how to format a resume, or you don't know the right way to portray yourself, that's an area where there's just no excuse. Um, and so you, know, you couldn't be more on point with that. I do, I do want to say because you, you mentioned it. And before we go, you know, this whole concept of putting, you know, um, representing yourself in the best possible way. That's a, clearly a recurring theme when we talk about resumes, but you have to be pragmatic and uh, in, in open about what that is. So if you are new in your career and you've only recently gotten out of school, then it would make sense to put that first, right? Highlight that because if that is your, your, your best and most recent um, accomplishment, graduating from college, for example, then it absolutely makes sense to be at the front of your resume. Um, and there's, I, I, I hear some weird opinions on this at times, very, very strongly rooted opinions too. And, and keep in mind, so much of this ultimately is subjective, yeah. but just you know, shooting down the middle, if you're a recent grad, go ahead and put that up top, right? Because that's what it's telling me and answers the question as to why you don't have a wealth of experience or the career progression that you know, ideally we'd like to see. You haven't had the chance yet. Conversely, if you're an old guy like me and you've been out of school for a really long time, I won't say your degree is irrelevant, but I'm saying it's largely irrelevant where everything you've done professionally is really what matters. And if someone gets to where my degree is on my fictitious resume that I don't have, um, then, you know, I, if they've gotten that far, they're probably already interested. So um, I, I, I would say, you know, you really just need to think about what you want the viewer um, to see you as in, in, in that, and let that be your guide um, in determining you know, what that best foot really looks like. And Pete, I think that is the best way to summarize th this podcast. When writing a resume, don't focus on you trying to get the job. Focus on what you want the recruiter to see about you. 
what skills out there that that they can see that they can capitalize on to bring you on board so that so that's spot on so i think they, that that right there how you market yourself how you present yourself how you put that commercial out there for yourself i think that's what's going to capture the essence of this of this episode something else i did want to say um going back real quick to to uh, to grammar and spelling errors folks don't only rely on spell check don't only rely on that. Pete is at the hundred percent correct. Give it to somebody else to to give it a, a second eyes, second set of eyes, a second opinion to make sure you caught everything. If you are an employer relations manager and you want to show on a resume, you have a lot of experience with unions. If you spell onions correctly, the spell check is not going to catch it, right? They're going to say, "Wow, he sucks at being a union person, man," but he's really good at onions. Right? So you want to make sure that it's on there as well. So Pete, with that said, I know we're a little bit over. That's my fault. I apologize. So what are three key things right now that people should walk away from, 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 from this show where tonight they can update those resumes and it can help them get that, that job, not that job, but get that attention from the recruiter. Three key things. So you're going to, push me into a corner, I'll, I'll say the first one is it, don't have just one resume, right? Have a base resume for sure, but be prepared to customize it for the job at hand. So the first thing I would do is commit yourself to that because it's a really important part of, um, of the job you know, search process. You know, number two, I, I would say, again, a theme that we've touched on repeatedly, make sure that you're presenting yourself in the way that you, know, you want to be seen and consider you know, what your greatest accomplishments are and then put them in order accordingly. Um, and, and, and I'll make sure it's formatted. I'll go, you know, 2A would be formatted in a clean way, right, for a digital resume. And then the third one, which is, you know, if all else, you know, make sure that, or if nothing else, make sure that you do have you know, proper grammar and spelling throughout your resume. It's really important. Um, when you're making that first impression. So uh, I think if, if we start there, we're, we're set up for uh, for a good outcome. Excellent, folks, you heard it from the man himself. That's Pete Newsom, president of Four Corner Resources. If you want to find out more about what we do, or even the Higher Calling podcast, go to, a, a, actually, just sh 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 shoot us an email, Calling at fourcornerresources.com. That's the number four cornerresources.com. If you want to find out more information about what we talked about today, we have a blog on our website, fourcornerresources.com forward slash blog. There is a lot of information out there. Folks, there's information out there for people looking for a job. There's information out there for employers on how to bring people and how to keep people there as well. There's a lot of information out there. Please go check it out. Again, that's fourcornerresources.com forward slash blog. Anything and else? Don't ever hesitate. I, you know, please call one of our recruiters, speak with them directly if you have if you have questions yeah. uh, in, in you, or you need help with your job search. That's what we're here for. That's what we do all day, every day. So by all means, you know, reach out to us and we'd love to um, help anyone personally who's listening. Roger that. All right. With that said, I'm Ricky Baez. I'll see you next time. Pete, I'll see you next time, sir. Ricky, thank you. All right, have a good one.